Good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank you for being here. I'm Susan Bachem, and I will be moderating the panel today. We have uh, two municipal court candidates that are going to that have joined us this morning. Um, as part of this first collaboration for judicial endorsements, we have the Veterans and Politics International, the Nevada Democratic Veterans and Military Families Caucus, the Nevada Veterans Association, and the Armed Forces Chamber. We would also like to thank our sponsors for um, having us here today, making this all possible. Stephanie Phillips, U.S. Senate candidate, she's here today. And we also have an anonymous donation on behalf of Jerry Willock. Uh, we'd like to thank Monzu um, Restaurant today. Um, they're very gracious to allow us to be here. During the interview process, um, it's going to be a short period of time. It might seem like it's very long and stressful for our judicial candidates, but um, it's always a lot of fun doing these panels. The panel members are going to introduce themselves. They're going to tell you who they are, what organization that they represent. Uh, we're going to have the candidates also introduce themselves, and they're going to maybe about a minute why you're running, um, why you're seeking the endorsements of the veterans community. I need you to remember, candidates, that this is an interview. It's not a debate. So when you are asked a question, you will be answering a question to each of our panel members that are here today. Um, we do not take pot shots at anyone, not at anybody. Not that I would expect that from you know any of the judicial candidates. But I will cut you off if that happens, and certainly redirect you. When you have a question from a panel member, you will be given approximately one minute to answer the question. So take a breath, think about it, get to the point. If you need them to readdress the question to you, do not hesitate to ask them to restate the question. Jim Jonas is going to be our timekeeper. Um, if you receive the yellow card, that will let you know that you have about 15 seconds to wrap it up. And once you're given the red card, somebody's going to take a hook and just kind of drag you off stage, okay? Just kidding. Okay, did I miss anything? Yeah, Judge, we need to do the first before we start. The, we need to do the pledge. And Absolutely. The okay, and Jim, Steve, who do you guys want to do the pledge today? That's going to be Stephanie Phillips. US okay, so Stephanie Phillips, United States Senate. Candidate, the invocation is first, and who's doing our invocation? Good morning. Let's stand, please. Let's pray. Father God, we ask for wisdom and guidance to help us in building a better city, a better state, and a better country. As we have interviews today for these judicial seats, we pray that your providence will put the right judges in office who will be fair, wise, and unbiased. We are grateful for all the candidates that are here and will be here for their time, dedication, and participation. Lord, we pray also for our country as a whole, the United States of America, as we are in this election year, we really need your sovereign hand to choose the best person to become our next president and commander in chief. We pray it will be someone who will preserve the heritage of our founding fathers uh, had in God, country, family, and freedom. Father, we lift up to you all the men and women in uniform that protect our country from all over the world who every day are putting themselves in harm's way for our safety and our freedoms. Bless them and protect them. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. If it please remain standing. Join me in honoring the flag. 
I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Thank you, everyone. So before we introduce the panel members, I would just like our audience and our panel members to know a little bit about the judicial system. Uh, the two candidates that we have here today are running for Las Vegas Municipal Court Judge in Department 5. Las Vegas Municipal Court hears misdemeanor cases. It could be a misdemeanor battery, domestic violence. It can be a driving under the influence, trespassing traffic tickets, contested traffic citations. So they do trials and hearings dealing with um, cases, controversies that arise in the city of Las Vegas. They also have multiple specialty court programs in the city of Las Vegas, including mental health, veterans treatment court, a yo court program, a women's program, a lot of different things. It's a really uh, great um, city court that we have and we're really excited to have our candidates here and for you to talk to them and, and ask them some questions. But before we get to our candidates, I would like to start with our panel members and we'll just kind of start with Jim Jonas. I'm going to have everybody introduce themselves. Please tell our audience and our judicial candidates um, who you are and what organization you represent. Thank you. Good morning, Jim Jonas, Director of Veterans of Politics. Good morning, Andre Haynes, Founder and CEO of Armed Forces Chamber PAC. Good morning, Patsy Brown, President of Armed Forces Chamber. Good morning, Donna Darden, Owner, CEO of Perfect Seminars LLC, and also representing uh, Democrats for Vets. Rob Lauer for Veterans in Politics. Frank Friends, Veterans in Politics, owner of Friends and Family Firearms. Tara Kellogg with the Democratic Party. Barbara Lucian representing Veterans in Politics. And we have our president of Veterans in Politics. Why don't you come up here and so we can See your face, Steve. <laughs> Steve Sanson, President of Veterans and Politics International. Thank you all for coming. Thanks, Steve. You know, it's always fun when you can put Steve Sanson on the spot. So, you know, he likes to do it to others. Okay, so we're going to get started this morning. And so we're going to start with our two municipal court candidates. And first, I'm going to have Ray Kennedy, who's sitting closest to me, introduce herself. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you, panel members. Thank you, Steve and the veterans groups for putting this together. My name is Ray Kennedy, and I am running for Las Vegas Municipal Court Judge, Department 5. Um, is that pretty much all you want us to say in the beginning? Or? Tell me about uh, why you're running. Oh, so I'm running because I think that the munis all courts, but in particular municipal courts, should be returned to the community. So I think it should be a friendly place where people are able to have access to justice and the resources that they need to become productive citizens. So I want to create a community-centered court that's transparent, fiscally responsible, and innovative. And Ray, before you finish up, can you just tell me what your qualifications are to run for judge, how long you've been a lawyer, that type of thing? Sure. So I have two bachelor's degrees and a master's degree in social work from the University of Michigan, Go Blue. Um, I have a law degree from Marquette University Law School. I've been barred in Wisconsin as an attorney for almost 20 years, um, and I'm now barred here in Nevada, having passed the bar exam with the July uh, bar exam. Um, I, my background, I have eight years of criminal defense. I did seven years of court administration, and I currently work at Legal Aid Center of Southern Nevada representing kids in court. Thank you. Rebecca? Thank you. Good morning. Oh, thank you. It's on. My name is Rebecca Wolfson. I am running for the Las Vegas Municipal Court Department 5. 
I am a proud born and raised Las Vegan. I love this community. I have been serving this community as an attorney for the last almost eight years, the last seven of which have been as a deputy city attorney for the city of Las Vegas. The first four years is my time as a city attorney. I was a prosecutor prosecuting in the very courtroom that I'm running in. And at that time, I always knew that there was more for me to do for the community that shaped me into the person that I am today. So about three years ago, I made the step and went over to the civil side of the city where I've been doing civil litigation, land use, code enforcement, legislation, and advising our elected officials for the last three years. But yet I knew there was still more for me to do for my community. I love working with people. I love helping people. And I love being a part of the legal community. I was raised and brought up in this legal community. I am proud of it. And I want to continue and make it an even better community. And I know I will be a great judge. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. OK, one quick thing, uh, candidates, just so you know, you'll be given a minute and 15 seconds to respond to a question once you get it from the panel member. When I put the yellow up, it means you got 15 seconds to wrap up, and I'm going to be very strict on time frame. So at a minute and 15 seconds, we get the red card, and I'll need you to stop. OK, thanks. So we're going to go ahead and get started. So why don't we start with you, Jim? Would you like to ask um, our candidates the first question? Yeah, this question's for both of you. Um, one of the things I'm frustrated about is how heavy-handed the Nevada State Legislature is as far as on judges. Um, basically, do you know who the legislative liaison is for the state of Nevada? And would you push back on that individual to get the legislature to stop um, mandating sentences and give more discretion to the judges? Uh, whichever one wants to start first. So I'm, I'm not sure what you what you mean by who the legislative liaison is because there's a ton of them. Um, but I think it's important to remember that the judicial branch is a separate branch of government. So while they certainly have a role to play, uh, just as every other citizen does in reaching out to their legislators and letting them know what they think is appropriate and not appropriate as laws for our community. Um, uh, I think you have to be very clear in maintaining those lines. I do think that judges should have discretion in being able to determine the sentence because they have the ability to take into account all the individual characteristics, what the victim is requesting, what's been argued by the defense attorney, what our community cares about in coming up with a, a sentence that is appropriate. Um, so I do think that judges should have that discretion. Thank you. Thank you, for the, thank you for the question. While the legislature makes the laws, the judges, is this on, are here, to en are here to enforce the laws. I think that your question might be more pointed towards possibly district court and justice court based on those mandatory minimum sentences that you were referring to. Now, I think the legislature did have good intentions behind making those laws in having somewhat of a consistency upon sentencing. It's not necessarily as involved in the municipal court, and I think the judges in municipal court have a wide range of discretion when it comes to sentencing. So I believe as a municipal court judge, my discretion will be within myself. And of course, I will follow the law as a judge, but that's our role and they are separate and distinct. Thank you. Commander Haynes. Andre Haynes, Armed Forces Chamber. This question is for both of the candidates. The question is, can you discuss your understanding of the unique mental health and wellness needs of veterans and how these factors might intersect with the justice system? Sure. Thank you. I know firsthand how veterans are impacted in this community. Not only was I a prosecutor in the municipal court, but I also participated in the veterans court as a prosecutor. I referred people to the veterans court. I know that mental health, trauma, PTSD, all plays a role when it comes to our veterans. They have seen things that most of us can't imagine seeing. And that should be taken into consideration when it comes to their conduct and their actions. However, accountability is still very important and public safety is still very important. So it's an interesting balance. Now, I think the municipal court is unique in the fact that their veterans court is 
I've seen it do incredible things for the people and the participants and the community. It is very well involved. There are people from various different veteran organizations that participate in the Municipal Court Veterans Program, and it's an incredible thing to see. So I would hope that it continues to be a good place for veterans and a safe place for people to come and get the help and the access to resources that they need. So I have, um, as I mentioned, a master's degree in social work focusing on mental health issues. So I have a keen understanding of some of the issues that not just veterans, but tons of individuals who've had traumatic experiences go through. Um, I, as the court administrator at Las Vegas Municipal Court, I oversaw the seven for the six specialty courts, so including the veterans court. Um, so I have, uh, and I'm also a tra trauma informed. Um, I've taken motivational interviewing trainings, um, trying to make sure that the folks that I work with, with my clients, or whether it's individuals in the community, that you are meeting them where they're at and making sure that you're not re-traumatizing them with forcing them to go through certain conversations or services that may not be necessary. So I, I think I'm particularly well situated to understand what those needs are. When I first started with municipal court, um, I asked the question, which is part of our statute, of why are we asking every individual who comes through here whether or not they're a veteran? because they have unique needs. Um, and that's part of what that discretion allows a judge to do, but then on the other hand, you do need to have certain laws to guide them. And every person should be asked about their veteran background so that we can get them the resources that they need. Thank you. Patsy, and if everybody would just um, restate their name and which organization that they're with before you ask a question, that would be great. Thank you. Patsy Brown, Armed Forces Chamber. This question is for both of you. Um, how would you prioritize addressing the legal needs of veterans within the justice system if elected? So, um, so as I mentioned, I have a background in mental health. Um, I also will sort of piggyback on, um, on Rebecca's uh, last answer, which is that there is a veterans court at municipal court. That's not the court, I would say, specifically right now that the new judge would be taking over. Uh, traditionally, Department 5 has handled the youthful offender court. However, it is important that behind the scenes, you're, you're working in a collegial manner with the other judges and sharing with them information and resources about how they can better help the veterans who are coming through the system. So making sure that we have a great way of screening individuals and referring them to that court, also asking individuals who come into the court whether they have a background in armed forces, um, and then even if they're not necessarily appropriate for veterans court, referring them to the resources that they need and making sure that we surround them with support. Thank you. And I agree. I think that it is a collaborative effort among the judges. The municipal court is comprised of six municipal court judges and eventually another traffic commissioner. However, it is they work together. They work together on a daily basis. I have great relationships with the other municipal court judges, and I know that the resources that they need and that they share are something that we can do together. Uh, the Veterans Court, like Ms. Kennedy said, is not the one that Department 5 oversees. However, I know that from experience, each courtroom, if you have veterans in them, regardless of which department you're in, we can get you to the right courtroom if we need to. And that's something that can come from the defense attorney bringing it to the judge's attention, the judge asking the individual, hey, are you a veteran? Do you need these services? Are you connected with the veteran community in Nevada? And I think that that's really important that we open up access to everyone, regardless of which department your case is in and which courtroom you will end in. So I think it's very important to work together as a group. Thank you. Donna. Hi, my name's Donna Darden. I'm with the Vets, the Democrats. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody starts screaming, yay. So, you know, I'm looking at that. Okay, my question is for the both of you. And by the way, it's an honor even talking to you. So I'm happy about that. Please share any cultural diversity programs you have taken and your feelings on the results. If you have not attended any educational training in that area, do you feel it's necessary to keep up with the minority community in which you will serve? Why and why not? 
Thank you for your question. I think that that's a really important question. One thing I'm proud of as a deputy city attorney for the city of Las Vegas are the steps that the city has taken in the last handful of years to appreciate diversity among our community. They have taken a really big role in the diversity, equity, and inclusion aspect. They have provided continuous training to most, if not all, of their city employees. And it has been enlightening and educational and informative. There are implicit biases within all of us. And it is something that takes acknowledgement, recognition, and active steps to avoid having it impact how you make decisions and how you go about your day. I can promise you as a judge, I will treat every single person with respect and equally. And I would continue to do that as I do today as a deputy city attorney. Thank you. Thank you. So as a woman of color, I've been immersed in several different communities, not only here in Las Vegas, uh, but where I'm from in Wisconsin. I've been here in Las Vegas for 10 years. Um, and one of the things that I love about this city is that it is nowhere near as segregated as it is where I'm from. So if you think about how segregated Chicago is, you just move it 45 minutes north and you have Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, but I have been immersed in cultural diversity and trainings since undergraduate. Um, I have several different certificates in DEI J, uh, JA training, so that's diversity, equity, inclusion, anti-racism um, trainings. Um, of course, I would treat everyone with dignity and respect, but I will treat them fairly and equitably, which is different from treating them equally. Um, equitably means that they get the resources they need, not that everyone gets the exact same resources. And I think it's important to be able to take into account the experiences, the lived experiences of the litigants who come before you. And you can only do that by taking time to actually figure out what it is that they need and then, um, and then provide them with the resources that are unique to them. Thank you. Before we move on, I'm just going to ask everybody once again to please silence your cell phones. Uh, we are here today for the first collaboration of the joint endorsement interviews for the Veterans in Politics, Nevada Democratic Veterans, Military Family Caucus, the Nevada Veterans Association, and the Armed Forces PAC. And again, we are interviewing the Las Vegas Municipal Court Judge Department 6 candidates, Ray Kennedy and Rebecca Wolfson. Mr. Lauer, we're going to move to you. And then again, please introduce yourselves. I can't see all of the name cards because I can't read that far. So if you'll just continue on down the line, that would be great. Thank you. Rob Lauer, Veterans of Politics. Um, DUIs have been a real crisis in our communities. We've seen a lot of people killed because of repeated DUI offenses and people getting out. <clears throat> so my question is philosophically and um, as a judge, how many strikes, how many DUI strikes does a defendant get before you drop the hammer, before you take away their license or sentence them to time in jail? So that's a great question. So first of all, one of the laws that we do have that I think Jim sort of alluded to where we have the legislature has stepped in and said that you will abide by certain guidelines, judges, is DUI laws. So we have some, some mandatory minimum requirements when it comes to those laws. Um, when it comes to sort of how many times before you drop the hammer, I think if you are paying attention to that person's needs, if somebody is unable to stop drinking and driving, they have an addiction, and that's something that they need help with. And so I, I always say that incarceration plays a role in our system. It shouldn't be the star of our system. So there are absolutely times where somebody needs to go to jail. But if you see them continuing the same behavior after still receiving consequences, then they have an addiction, they have an issue that they need help for. Jail does not solve addiction problems. Treatment solves addiction problems. And so that's the kind of individual that needs to get treatment and we need to support them. The kind of treatment that we have generally right now is for the most part not long enough for folks to actually get their addiction needs addressed. But one of the great things is that Las Vegas Municipal Court does have a DUI court where they can get services for a longer period of time. Thanks. Thank you for your question. I agree with you that DUIs are an extremely big problem in our community. I am sick of seeing it on the news every day that someone is either getting hurt or killed by someone going out and drinking and driving and making that decision. DUIs are interesting because they are enhanceable offenses. And while the municipal court only handles misdemeanors, DUI second offenses 
are also misdemeanors. So I've seen multiple times, hundreds of cases where people are coming in and it's not their first DUI, it's not even their second DUI because it has to be within seven years of the first one. And there's an inherent problem in our community where people feel the need to get behind the wheel after having drank and it is extremely problematic. Now, as a judge, I agree there are times where jail is appropriate, but there are also times where treatment is truly needed. It's a hard balance in certain situations, but public safety is my number one priority and the most important thing. So that will always stand out. And at the end of the day, if I can help someone and get them the help they need while also keeping our community safe, I will do everything in my power to do both. Thank you. Frank Friends, Veterans and Politics and owner of Friends and Family Firearms Training. Um, a lot of uh, misdemeanors and time with the judges and court time and issues with cops and cops times and resources being caught up stems back to a lot of uh, assaults or frays, basic assaults, things like that. Would either one of you guys be opposed to uh, a law or something you can introduce called mutual combat, where if two parties decide to fight, no public damages are done and no weapons are used, the outcome of the fight is not chargeable by any offense. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. That's an interesting question. I, <laughs> again, I believe the legislature is in charge of making the laws. If that's something that the legislature wants to entertain, then that is up to them. If that's what they decide to do as a judge, I will follow the law. However, I'm not necessarily pro violence in any circumstance. Um, I think that there are probably better ways to handle situations than what was just suggested. Um, but again, as a judge, I'm here to follow the law. And as of right now, I don't believe that that's part of our law. Thank you. So as you ask the question, of course, my brain starts to go to like, we could sell tickets, there could be popcorn, like it could get very, very interesting. Um, but I actually have to agree with Rebecca on this one. I don't know that that's the way that we want to solve problems. Um, I think one of the things that has been sucked out of our all of our, our entire communities has been a little bit of compassion and grace towards others. Um, and I think there are other ways that we can resolve conflict that's more positive um, than even if they, we have two willing people. It, it kind of reminded me of the old school duel, like meet me, you know, meet me here at 12 o'clock, right? Um, mm -hmm. There's some interesting considerations there, but but I have to agree with Rebecca on this one. I don't I don't want to advocate violence. I think we can figure out a better way to, to resolve our conflicts. Hello, my name is Tara Kellogg and I'm with the Democratic Party. And I would uh, like to ask this question to both candidates. Um, uh, I would like to know how you, what you think about cyber stalking. Um, I would like to know if, uh, when, is harassment and stalking and threats, when does it become a criminal act or enforceable? So thank you for that question. Um, thankfully, I have never been a victim of cyber stalking, stalking, bullying, um, any of those sorts of things, so, a lot of which is on the rise these days, in particular in the cyber sphere, um, because people feel the anonymity of a keyboard or a screen allow them to say some really harsh and sometimes unfair things to people that have um, real life consequences in people's lives. Um, and so I think it's important that we take those issues seriously. I understand the conundrum that law enforcement is in as well with those situations though, because it's often difficult to prove that somebody has done that. Individuals who engage in this kind of behavior are often master manipulators who do things in a way that can, uh, they can sort of cover their trails and in a way that they can gaslight the victim into making other people believe that she's the problem. And I say she because statistically, that's what we're referring to, um, that she's the problem or that she's making it up. Um, and so I think we have a culture in the United States where we haven't, ne haven't always believed victims. So I think that there's more that we can do in terms of educating the public about what these issues are, um, educating our prosecutors to make sure that those crimes are in fact prosecuted properly. Thank you. Thank you for your question. 
there are varying degrees of the stalking crime. Of course, there's a misdemeanor stalking charge, and then there is a felony aggravated stalking charge. Each has different elements. In terms of cyber stalking, I think the internet is an interesting place. I think it is given people access and ability to put things out there and to harass and stalk people, unfortunately, and sometimes with zero consequence. It's problematic. But at times it's, again, how do you find and how do you enforce it, especially if it's anonymous. It's an unfortunate system that we have and it's an unfortunate circumstance every time. But that's our world and that's what we have when we have instant access to information and the ability to communicate. Now in terms of in, in real life stalking, I think that it should be handled appropriately and people should be held accountable and that we should do everything in our power to prevent it from reoccurring and keeping people safe. Thank you. Hi, good morning, Barbara Lucian with Veterans in Politics. Um, it's critical that judges remain impartial and unbiased even in complex cases. This is for both of you. What strategies do you personally remain, do you use to remain impartial for these cases? Thank you. Um, and as a former prosecutor, I know that it may appear that I come from one side. However, I can guarantee in many criminal defense attorneys out there have always told me that I was firm but fair. I look at each case individually. I look at each person's circumstances individually. I don't give weight to things that don't necessarily deserve weight, but I take everything into consideration. I will have the ability to look at everyone and treat them with equity and to treat them fairly and keep, again, keep our public safe, but help when I can. Thank you. So I think it's important to, to recognize, and, and I appreciate that Rebecca mentioned this earlier, to recognize that we all have biases. It is when we pretend that we don't, that they have the ability to affect our behavior. Um, and so I'm, I'm quite aware of what my biases are. I check them on a daily basis um, to make sure that they're not affecting you know, my decisions. The other thing that I believe in is leading with, with data, with research. What does the research tell us about how we should approach this particular person or this particular offense? We have decades of research that we tend not to use when it comes to criminal justice. Um, I think it's because we're humans and we're, our frailties are that we tend to think that our own gut is more reliable than research, and it's not. So I like to say I lead with research or data and I follow with compassion. Um, I think it's important to make sure that you are taking all of the circumstances into account and having over 25 years of experience as a social worker, a mediator, an advocate, a trial attorney, Attorney in civil and criminal courts and a court administrator, I think I have the ability to do that. Thanks. Looks like we have another question in the back from Mr. Friends. Yes, Frank Friends. Um, so lately, if you paid attention to the news, you see a lot of these biases that you're both talking about leak into judges, leak into prosecutors, the things they prosecute, the way they go about it. Some of their pretty much unjust sentencing and things like that. So as an independent voter, I'd like to know which party you most identify with, Democrat, Green Party, Mises Caucus, Independent, or Republican? I'm a registered Democrat. Thank you for your question. And while this race is nonpartisan, I am also registered as a Democrat. Thank you. Okay, so we're not quite wrapped, ready to wrap up yet, but um, if, and we don't have time for each of our panel members to ask an additional question, but I'd like to come back to the front. Mr. Jonas, Commander Haynes, if anybody on our front row has another follow-up question, please um, ask it now. Thank you. So it's not necessarily, well, it's a question, but it's kind of theoretical. Um, one of the things that I've noticed and I look for in a judge is humility. So you guys, a little bit in your bio, both of you kind of touch on why you're running, but specifically, why are you guys running? Because let's face it, as an attorney, you'll make a lot more money than as a judge. <laughs> Ray, I'll start with you. This is true. Um, you hit that one on the head. Uh, but no, I've ne I never went into the law to make money. Um, 
I have a social work background. It's, it's not a coincidence that I, I there's I have three sisters, all four of us work in social work in some form or fashion or have a degree in social work in some form or fashion. Um, those concepts of justice and equity um, and helping others was ingrained in us uh, growing up. Um, I, I, just, I started my journey to run three years ago. I used to work at municipal court. When I started there, um, I believed that it was a court that um, had all of the tools to be the greatest court in the United States. And I happen to think that Las Vegas is the greatest city in the world. I have the welcome to Las Vegas sign tattooed on my back because that is how much I love this city, okay? And I saw that it had all of the tools to be the greatest municipal court in the world. But I didn't think that it was using its tools the best way, in the most efficient way for folks. And so I decided that I wanted to run because the judges of municipal court are the gatekeepers of change. And in order for me to be able to help folks, I have to become a judge. So ultimately, that's why I decided to run, having peeked behind the curtain and saw how policies, procedures, and practices were made. Oh, may I answer that question, Mr. Haynes? Yep. Thank you. <laughs> I've always known since I was a young child that I was going to end up in the legal world one way or another. I am blessed and fortunate to have two parents that have shown me what it means to serve the public in a meaningful way, and they've done it in an incredible fashion. My mother started the mental health court and the drug court in the district court many years ago. I watched that growing up, and I saw firsthand the impact that she had on our community. When I became an attorney and when I started working for the city of Las Vegas, of course I did not go into it for the money because the government does not pay what private practice pays. But yet I have not left. I've been given opportunities, but I've said no. I love my community and I wanna continue serving it in an even more meaningful way. I know that my skill set and my resources and Everything that I can do is best served as a judge, and I hope the voters will take a chance on me and give me the opportunity to show them just how good of a judge that I can be. Thank you. Commander Haynes, did you have another question? Okay, thank you. Andre Haynes, Armed Forces Chamber. This is for both of you ladies. With the unique dynamics surrounding the issue of prostitution in Las Vegas, how do you envision balancing legal enforcement with support for those involved in the industry, emphasizing a fair and just approach. Thank you for your question. You know, the city of Las Vegas is interesting because while soliciting is a misdemeanor, we used to see that all the time. And as a prosecutor, I saw it often. Now the municipal court is very, very, very good at their specialty courts. And in fact, one of them is called the Women in Need Court. And it is specific to those that are charged with crimes related to soliciting and prostitution and people who, even if you're not charged with those crimes, but if you're experiencing that and you have a background and that's, that's the cycle that you're in, the court has resources to help you not only get out of it, but to help you improve your life and, and become the best version of yourself. And I have seen it firsthand. The Women in Need Court run by Judge Leung right now is one of my favorite specialty courts. And I have seen firsthand just how impactful the municipal court can be on these people's lives. And I want to only continue to make it a safe place for people who are not only defendants, of prostitution, women who come in who are being charged with a crime for it, but to look at that and say, how can I help you? How can I get you out of this cycle? And how can we move past this part of your life? Thank you. So I have represented a ton of women who've been in the sex industry, um, and not one of them have ever told me that when they were a little girl, they wanted to grow up to be in the sex industry. The vast majority of the time, they come from backgrounds where they've been traumatized, they've been uh, exploited, taken advantage of, and a lot of these women are actually being trafficked as opposed to them, you know, you, you sometimes see this image of somebody who says, no, this is exactly what I wanna do. The vast majority of women are exploited and being placed into that uh, particular situation against their will. Um, they get addicted to drugs and alcohol and it's a vicious cycle. 
So I do agree that we have the women in need um, specialty court in Las Vegas. Um, I think it's important, you know, we live in a society where we have supply and demand. And historically, we have only focused on the supply side by prosecuting women um, for, for prostitution, for selling their, their bodies. I think it's important to also enforce the demand side as well. Um, and so I think that we need to get um, more resources and services to women who come in um, and treat them more as the traumatized victim that they are um, and make sure that we have trauma-informed services to assist them. Thank you. I think we have uh, time for one more question. So I think Donna raised her hand first, so that's where we're going to go. Hello. Um, it's... The question is, you both can answer, but I'm going to um, glean back to an interview that, that you did, Risha. Um, in a recent interview, Veterans in Politics, you stated that there is not enough accountability uh, for on our judges. Uh, I believe the word you used was, we need more scrutiny. Would you please share what you meant by that and give at least one example where you felt it was lacking? And the second part of that would be, based on your answer, what measurables will you implement to support your views on judge accountability? Please be specific. Thank you. Oh, gosh, with only a minute, 15 seconds, I could talk all day on this. But thank you. That's a wonderful question. Thank you for having watched my, uh, my interview with Steve. Um, I do agree. Uh, obviously, I believe that judges aren't scrutinized enough. I think judges in particular a lot of the public understands that they're elected, but they don't put them into the same category as other elected officials that are held accountable. And municipal court judges in particular sort of fly under the radar. We're lower on the ballot. People kind of forget about municipal court. Lots of our community members don't even know that we have a municipal court. They don't know what it does. And so part of this campaign is my hope to elevate this conversation. But I think that judges need to be held accountable. And, and, and when I'm elected judge, one of the things that I will encourage is you see around our community, people have started court watch parties and court support where they will have the community come in to watch that judge and to start to track how they are treating folks, how they are sentencing individuals. I would welcome anybody into my court. My courtroom will be unlocked. I also will be having a community advisory council and meeting on a quarterly basis to share data and try to find out how we can better serve our community. I have seen instances where judges have been disrespectful to litigants, they have been condescending, and they forget that we work for the public. The public does not work for us. It's an interesting question because I believe that judges all over the community play such a pivotal role in our society. Yes, they're held to such a high ethical standard, and I believe that it goes both ways. Not only should judges be more active in reporting attorneys, but attorneys should also be more active in legitimate reporting of judges. Um, I think it's important that judges maintain a courtroom of respect and of high ethical caliber. And like Ms. Kennedy said, my courtroom will also be open to the public as all should be and are. And anyone that wants to come in and observe court should be able to, and they should be able to provide the public with more of an understanding as to what our courts do. Um, I think that that's where a big disconnect comes in in our community. Not enough of our community understands the judicial aspect. And I, as a judge, would love to get the community more involved. And that way they can become more knowledgeable as to what judges do in our community, especially in the municipal court. Thank you. Okay, so we're, we have about at the end of our time. So now each of the candidates is going to have the opportunity to give a closing statement and let our panel members, our audience members, and those that are watching live today um, tell us all why they are the best uh, person for this job in Las Vegas Municipal Court Department 5. And we'll start with Ms. Kennedy. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, panel members. Again, thank you, everyone, for giving us this opportunity to share why we'd like to run. Um, my taglines are caring, committed, and competent. Um, as I mentioned, I adore this city. I care about the health, safety, and prosperity of everyone in it. 
I've been committed to public service both in my personal life and my professional life. I volunteer at a couple of different organizations in the city, the center as well as Three Square, um, and I've been doing that for many, many years. And and I'm committed, um, I, excuse me, and I'm competent. I, as I mentioned, I have over 25 years of experience. I have the greatest depth of experience up here, having served before the bench and then have an, uh, having an understanding of what happens uh, behind the bench in terms of policies, practices, and procedures. And I have management experience, and it's important because judges actually manage, they specifically hire their assistant, and they also manage the staff in their courtroom. And when you don't have those management skills, your courtroom is, is become, can become pretty toxic. So I love this community, and I hope I have the opportunity to continue to serve this community. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, everyone here today. It's been an honor to come before you and to present myself and why I'm running. I think good government is of utmost importance. I think we need good judges in our community. We need people who are running for the right reasons and who will do the right job. What I can tell you is that I will work extremely hard at being the greatest judge that I can be. I love this community. I want to continue serving it in an even more meaningful way. I know that my skill set is best served on the bench, dealing with people every single day. I love the courtroom. I respect the courtroom. I respect the system. I want to make it as great as I can, and while following the law, doing the best job that I can. Thank you. All right, thank you, um, Ray Kennedy and Rebecca Wolfson for being with us today. I would also like to once again thank the Veterans in Politics International, Nevada Democratic Veterans Military Family Caucus, Nevada Veterans Association, and the Armed Forces Chamber PAC for being with us today. I'd also like to thank Monzu Italian Oven and Bar for allowing us to have this um, interview process all day long here today. And special thanks to Stephanie Phillips, U.S. Senate candidate for being a sponsor and an anonymous, anonymous donation, I can't talk today, on behalf of Jerry Willick. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for being here.